What is up, everyone, and welcome back to the Fast Life Podcast again. Uh, we got my buddy, Sean, owner and operator and creator of TOL, Top of the Line Designs. Uh, Sean's one of the dudes that was, uh, you know, big guy in the industry for the big wheel stuff, but he really got his start way back in the day building choppers, and he's kind of been kind of like the big brother to me and a lot of people I know in this industry for, you know, well over 10 years, damn near 20 years for that matter. So I'm glad he... Uh, Gave us some of his time, even though uh, <laughs> this podcast ends abruptly. But at the same time, it was a good time hanging out with Sean all last week in Vegas, doing the bike at his shop. And he let me drive around his Hellcat all week. And uh, I was kind of uh, liking that, you know, don't really have a nice car. Never really have. Uh, that was pretty, pretty nice and pretty cool. Um, thanks, Sean. <laughs> now I want a badass car. Anyway, uh as I said before, man, you guys need to check out D&D. They're going to be at Destination Daytona this coming up, Daytona Bike Week. Check them out. If you don't get an exhaust, at least go by, say hi, see what they're up to. Uh, maybe talk with Rusty. Let him talk you into why their pipes are so badass. So check them out. DndExhaust.com as well as DND Exhaust on Instagram. And uh, you can always phone in order 844-DND pipe and use that Fast Life code to get some fucking dollars off of it so check it out uh thank you guys for for checking us out again uh also you can look at my boy texas performance mc down in cedar park texas uh like i said before we will be together at giddy up which i'm super excited about uh i think it's three or four weeks away man it's, it's coming up quick so all you california guys that were talking about rolling you know, I don't want to hear no shit, man. I just did it in the cold, so you can do it in, in the spring. It's going to be a good time. We're going to be drinking beer and having a good time and and just sitting around campfires doing, you know, campfire shit, whatever that is, you know, whatever, right? But anyway, check out Mark at TexasPerformanceMC.com as well as Instagram and give him a shout out or a follow or a fucking, hey, what's up, man? I heard about you on the podcast. Whatever you can do, say what's up to him. T-Bar Jesus himself. I also want to thank Paint Huffer Metal Flake. You can check them out on Instagram on the word I just said and PaintHuffer.com. If you want to order some of the Flakes, Pearls, tapes, and all the other badass things they sell through their website. Yeah. Once again, uh, Brian from Paint Huffer was the one that really helped make this uh, this trip possible to come out there. And also, you guys on the Patreon were a big help. So we, uh, I greatly appreciate all that. And I hope that, you know, I've been trying to, you know, with this podcast, I've been trying to bring in some people from the big wheel bagger industry that I felt like have a lot of integrity that have a lot of skill and a lot of business sense. And they're just, you know, real fucking biker, you know, type dudes. And I think that Sean is one of those. Sean's been a, he's, he's literally helped me and my buddy Brad out on, I mean, whenever you've heard the stories of us talking about breaking down in the desert, we rode like, you know, 500 miles with one shock a piece. And when we got to Vegas, Sean's the one that helped us out, fix us up. When my dude's, uh, that same fucking trip when my dude's bike blew up, Sean's the one that housed his bike and helped him get his shit back on the road so he could uh, trailer it back to Texas. You know, he's he's always been there helping guys like me out, you know, throughout the years and never really asking much for it. So he's a really good dude. So I hope you guys follow TOL Designs on Instagram and, uh, you know, they're good dudes. And I hope you really enjoy this podcast because I enjoyed hanging out with Sean and getting to know him a little bit better than, you know, what we have in the past. And I hope you get a little bit of that taste of who he is to this podcast. And, uh, yeah, it's all, it's good, man. Uh, so yeah, I'm not going to hold you to this much longer, man. Check it out. Sean, TOL Designs. Hey guys, you ready to let the dogs out? Here we go. Well, you gotta let me hear it first before you air it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> We're just gonna run. That's this not shit. part of a podcast, right? No, it's, you gotta let it go, man. So, uh, I'm here with uh, Sean from uh, TOL Designs. He started this shit. Uh, when did you start this? TOL got in the bike business 25 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> 25 years ago, my fucking. You know, honestly, the first person they got me interested in was um, Matt Hotch. He was my, you know, he was my industry hero. Him, yeah. Roger Goldhammer, Ron Sims, fucking, of course, Jesse James. All those guys were like fucking industry heroes. Good part is, you know, a couple of them become super close friends of mine. Like, you know, Matt Hotch is uh, one of my closest friends in the industry. Roger Goldhammer is a super close friend of mine. And, uh you know, those you, are the guys that put me in it. Yeah, you started, you were telling me that you had started everything back in, uh, 
in um, Detroit. So you're originally from there. What was, like, what was your Detroit life like, and what what did that? How did that like turn into motorcycles? You know what I mean? Uh, my Detroit life was um, with motorcycles. Was it was I ran the business wrong. It was like yeah. I got in the motorcycle industry back then. What you see a lot of fucking guys in this industry. Like, I'm guilty of it being the queer of the industry. Yeah. Fucking got into it for all the wrong reasons. Thinking, like, drinking, partying, you know, fucking bringing no value to the rela- uh, to the um, industry. Um, you know, fucking going to the strip joint, hanging out. Like, none of that shit brought value to the industry. So, you know, I learned a lot. Like, you know, I... I I failed a lot because of everything I did wrong back then. But yeah. nowadays it's different. Now I see all these other people; they're they're just bringing zero um, value to the yeah. uh, to the industry. Well, I think that like back in the day, so we're talking like when you first started getting into this, it was in the late nineties, right? Yep. It so was 90, 99. So you're you're probably seeing a, a world like in, in enticed by like the lifestyle of being a biker and a bike shop owner and a builder. No, nah, it was much more cool then. It was Back then, cool. it was much more cool then. Now it's just <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, the, 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 at least there was a lot more cool people back then. Now yeah. it's just like. It's fucking, you know, affliction shirts and fucking all the gay shit that you can think of. <laughs> you know, like people are more impressed about, you know, having their fucking fingernails done and, you know, fucking cool yeah, jeans. Yeah, yeah. And, you it's, know, they're. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fashion statement now to be a biker than it was back then, right? Yeah. yeah. In some aspects, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, the fucking first thing I did, even though. You know, I had a fucking, I had a dream. My dream was like fucking, I wanted to be a welder. Mm -hmm. I was horrible in the beginning. I mean, my very first motorcycle I built, you know, it it was such a fucking, this isn't even right to say, but it was a fucking, it was a con. Like, not that I was conning anybody, but it was like, fuck it, bike looked fucking amazing. It looked fucking so nice at one fucking Autorama, fucking best motorcycle, this and that. Same year that fucking Chip Foos fucking won the Riddler Award there. Yeah. I won the fucking best uh, bike, and the bike was a straight pile of shit. (laughs) It was. I mean, you look at the bike now, and you're like, fuck, that bike's amazing. It was a pile of shit. I fucking had no idea what I was doing, had more issues with that motorcycle, and this and that. But I learned from that motorcycle. I learned, you know... What to, what what not to do? Yeah, and I I you know it was a good starting foundation for me, and it was like I built that bike and I was like fuck I want to build this bike I want it to look like a fucking you know a hot match bike and I want you know this and that and I would go to the industry fucking you know the uh, dealer trade show and you know I would follow people and like Roger Goldhammer and fucking Aaron Green Aaron Green's become a good friend of mine and you know Paramount Custom Cycles those guys were fucking building you know. You know, fucking things we can only imagine back then that they were yeah. building. Him and his brother, and and Roger and, and his brother, they were fucking building such cool fucking shit. Like I had no idea what they were building. I didn't even know what the fuck they were, uh, how they did it. But yeah. I was like, man, I would like. That's who I looked up to. I had good industry heroes, like heroes in the industry, like fucking guys that were dirty welding, machining. Yeah. Those are the guys I wanted to fucking be like. And now... That's, that's like, a good point. Because when you think about some of the guys that were back in that world of that, that you know, pre, you know, biker build-off era. Like, these dudes were just, like, hustlers out there building bikes and, you know, doing stuff like that. They weren't so much, like, putting on a show to of, of their persona, their you know, and things like that. Like, it wasn't so much... We didn't have... You didn't have social media then either. No. So, no. it was like... You saw these dudes, they were living the industry. They were living the life. Yeah, we we had the internet, but we had a, a thing called back then, I can't remember the name of it, but it was like a website where we saw some of the new things coming and this and that. And, you know, fuck, we had Jim Nasty. Jim Nasty was building fucking the coolest things ever. And we had fucking Paul Yaffe. Those guys were all the fucking top name guys that were like Jim Nasty, dude. Like his brother was a buddy of mine. Like those guys were all fucking. Nothing but the cool shit. Coolest yeah. things ever. Roger Goldhammer, every year, show up at Cincinnati Dealer Trade Show, like, doing, like, 
the air ride, fucking front, back, this, that, everything. I was like, fuck, these guys are fucking amazing. I was like, those were my fucking industry heroes. Yeah. Not the guys that are fucking on the social media, drinking, fucking, you know, fucking at the strip joint, fucking taking pictures of their drinks and, you know, their Rolexes and their bullshit. This That shit don't impress me. It's the dudes that are, that have built this industry. Fucking, we, we, you know, like I said, man, we had, we had really, good fucking leaders back then yeah as opposed to now yeah it's crazy there's only like a handful of people that really uh you know that are doing things on that level anymore you know what i mean oh yeah we have, we have some really really good builders now and you know they you know they, they they're fucking the guys that impress me that are legitimately fucking doing the work they're le- like even though the owners the people that are the owners and they're investing the money and and, you know, y- you have to have a fucking guy that knows how to run a business, first and foremost, has yeah. to have the money to be able to build a brand, build a company. That's his, it is how it goes. But the things that impressed me are the people that fucking knew how to build these motorcycles. Mm-hmm. We had fuck, we had fucking uh, Mike Maldonado. Every name I'm sure I'm giving out right now. 99% of the people don't even know who these fucking people are. Mike Maldonado, <laughs> fucking bad at one of the best bike builders in the world. Matt Hotch, fucking probably the best. Yeah. Roger Gold, ever. nobody better than that guy. Nobody better than him. And I'm telling you, they were all fucking amazing fucking builders. Yeah, the, the, man, it, it's weird because you, you were telling me, like, you, you started out in, like, uh, Detroit, right? Yep. And then, you know... Then you came, where'd you go next? Was it Phoenix or was it LA? Next? No, I went to LA. Yeah. Went to LA, started my life over. I mean, my life was a little crazy back then. And, you know, fucking, like I said, I. Uh, you were doing it the other way, strip clubs, money. Yeah, yeah. All, the wrong, all the wrong life. All yeah. the wrong life. You know what I'm saying? Doing everything, uh, everything wrong. Yeah. Like fucking straight, fucking straight to the bottom of this industry. That's where I was going. So then when I left, I, I, I went to L.A. and I had some friends out there and, you know, I had a lot of help out there. Really good friends. My buddy Robert became, you know, like I got, became a closer friend to Matt Hotch and just a lot of really good people in the industry. My buddy Wayne from Bad Island Toys and like like really good, genuine people. And that's what picked myself back up and got to where I am. You know, and I had fucking, you know, you know I, I did have help, but also got up every day and went to work fucking at yeah. 5 a.m. Every day. And the very first tool I ever bought 25 years ago was a fucking $7,000 welder. I didn't even know what the fuck to do with it. Yeah. I didn't even know what to do with it. I was the worst welder. So what was it that, that made you want to start welding, though? Like, what was, the, you know, the, the inspiration there? Uh, it was probably the same thing most people. Like, the Motorcycle Mania, the Jesse James, the yeah. fucking, you know, Matt Hodge. Like, the, those guys were all my buddies. But, like, fucking Roger Goldhammer. All people that really fucking built this industry. That's yeah. what I wanted to do. I wanted to know how to... I wanted to be a welder. That's what mm-hmm. I wanted to do. Yeah. And so, like, you, you started doing the welding stuff. Like, was that how, like, you first started doing kind of the, the bike stuff? Was just, like, doing... Just bikes. Just that was it. custom, like... No cars, none of that. Just bikes. Yeah. And so, were you doing that in L.A. or what? Yeah, I was doing that. Oh, yeah. Well, I started working for a guy out there. And I was the welder and the fucking builder. I built a lot of motorcycles under a company name that were, you know, they were award winners and this and that. And that's what I did when I got out there. Because yeah. the guy knew who I was. They, he knew of me and this and that. And, you know, I was kind of, a, you know, I mean, not to be in a gay way, fucking like I was kind of an asset to his company. Yeah. So I helped him build his company. And then, you know, he, he ended up like going back home to Hawaii and this and that. But, you know. We made some good money back then, and we built some nice motorcycles, and him and I remained very close friends and to this day. So, And I believe, you know, over the years, every time I got a little bit of money, I bought tools, bought this, bought that, I fucking bought, you know, equipment, and yeah. because I wanted to be better and better and better. You know, the weird thing about, like, California and the motorcycle industry is that, like, the older I've got in this world, you know, because I came in big time into this, this scene when the uh, na- nationwide rise, when the big wheel baggers things yep. started hitting. And big wheel baggers didn't seem to have a stronghold or even a stance in California. It was like they, the more I look back at like the uh, the biker build offs and all that stuff, you see all these badass shops that were all, a lot of them were in California. Yep. But then when the big wheel bagger thing hit up, it was like, like majority like Arizona and East. 
Yep. So it felt like California didn't really have a like a stake in it, almost. Yeah. You know? It seems like they've kind of gotten a little bit of it. In it. Not a lot. It never really got that crazy because you have a lot of fucking guys that are like, you know, they're just fucking West Coast dudes, fucking hard, hard riders, hard. Yeah. You know, those dudes are fucking riding, riding super hard, you know, fucking fast, wheelies, this, that. They're not doing that on those bikes. Yeah. So... You're right. I mean, like back then, it was like I remember. I'll never forget. Like uh, I was like, I bought my first bagger, and I'm like, hey, you know what? I'm gonna I want to put a big wheel on my bike. I'm gonna get a fucking one of those twenty threes. I want to fucking make a twenty three bike. And then the very first twenty three bike I ever saw, it was fucking Nick, Nick Trask, and it was I think Pomona or something. Yeah. And I was like, oh, he has a fucking twenty three bike. That's awesome. And then John fucking showed up. He started building these fucking bikes. Twenty six. With that with that fucking white bike, that dirty, uh, dirty money, dirty money. I love that bike. Yeah. <laughs> And he was the guy that fucking, honestly, it was him and there was an, another buddy, of, uh, a good f- a buddy of mine that built a big wheel bagger and he was like the f- fucking guy that really started it. Like fucking, um, uh, he, he was the guy fucking that started him and John. And it was like off to the race. Was, John's made a bunch of fucking money because of the big wheel thing. And, yeah. you know, good for him. Well, that Dirty Money bike was pretty dope. It was kind of like a fresh, you know, after the chopper thing kind of took its, uh, you know, it, it took a, you know, a seat, you know, a back seat to the industry. And then, you know, you had bobbers kind of running around doing things. And yep. then that big wheel thing was kind of like a, a breath of fresh air of like, wow, this is, this is extravagant. This is big. This is. Well, a lot of people made money with it. Yeah. There's a lot of parts to sell. Yeah. On a bagger, as opposed to a chopper, a bobber, like, you know, you're buying bags, you're buying this, you're buying all the all the fucking bullshit that mm-hmm. you can put on a bike. And there are a lot of people that are like, oh, the more the more shit you put on a bike, fucking the better. So the you cooler. would say probably like the John Shope and everything. I think I've, I've referenced this before, but you would probably say it was probably like 2009, 10-ish. Because I remember the first time I saw Yaffe. Yep, yep. that was it. The first Yaffe time was I, the one that did the 26 bike. Yeah, I saw Yaffe's uh, Chippecobber bike at yep. Rock Rally. I had a booth next to him at that rally. And I just kept looking at bike gloves. Road glides were the ugliest fucking bikes forever. Until and they then, put a big wheel until to they took up that big, gap. It took that big wheel on there. Yep. And then that was a bat, it was the best bike ever because yep. it was the most rare of the baggers at the time, too. Because you would see ele- street glides, electric glides, ultra classics. They were all fucking uh, bat wing fairings. You know yep. what I mean? Yep. But yeah, I saw that bike and I I didn't even think nothing of it. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool, you know. But and then lo and behold, like three years later, it became such the social norm. Do, do you remember uh, Doug Eagleson? No, Doug. I remember his name. He, though. he is the guy that fucking. He was always fucking super fucking out of the fucking who had normal the- always out of the fucking like normal fucking motorcycles. That he was the guy that started this big wheel thing. He was the first one to do Who it. Who was the dude in Arizona that had the uh, that had the, the the pointed Yaffe tank with the red seat and had like that one spoke on the wheel? It was like the first short neck ever. D- Doug is a that was him. That's okay, Doug. I was Doug. thinking that was who. Doug's it was. such a good buddy of yeah. mine, and he's such dude like coolest fucking like if you're gonna ever like like. He's one of the coolest dudes. Is he still doing Ever stuff now or what? Yeah, but he builds hot rods. I mean, that's that's a hobby to him. You know what I'm saying? Like, he always come out with something cool on the side, but it's a hobby to him. That red bike was just, it was a road king. It was like... No, it was black. It was, it was flat king black. King Kong. Yeah. King Kong. My buddy fucking... Uh, uh, Mike Porm helped him finish it. Yeah, yeah. King Kong. That bike was sick, man, because that, that was the first year we came dope. to uh, the first year we came to uh, Arizona Bike Week. Yep, and I saw that bitch there, and it was it was dope, man. Super dope. That's where I fell in love with the pointed tanks because I I had just made one for my own personal bike, uh, my orange one. What's his name? I was doing all the time Trask. Yeah, Trask is doing it, and then yep. you know Yaffe came out later with the the. Well, Yaffe was doing Yaffe was Not doing Yaffe, uh, he was doing pointed Paul Tracy. Paul was. Tracy was doing, but the, Paul yeah. Yaffe was doing them on all his choppers. Yeah. Yeah, you got to give a bunch of credit to Yaffe because he was fucking. He's definitely the one thing about him. He saw the future. He was doing the choppers and he started building fucking like yeah. factory Harleys, and it was like, what the fuck is this guy doing? Who is that? And the next thing you know, he was the fucking he, one of the he, originals. Like, yeah, original guys that were fucking that were fucking like. That's got to be hard though. Is is being one of the the co founders of the Big Wheel movement and then turn around turning around and. Uh, 
seeing where this is going and feeling like it's time for something new. And, you know, you saw what he was doing with the, uh, the SRT and the fat front tires and yep. it's, 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 it's gained traction. It is, but he, you know, you got to give it like, again, I'm all about giving credit and the guy back from Michigan from native. He's the guy who started native? with that fat, fat tire thing. That's right. I remember native custom baggers, right? Yep. 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 He was the guy to get fucking, uh, tires from back in the day. Yep. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> So now everybody's fucking having all these tires made for these uh, for these uh, wheels and you know between uh, SMT and Metal Sport and this and that you know I think that's where it's going. The good thing about doing that is they're still sticking with the baggers, which yeah. means more parts to sell and this and that. But you know, like I said, man, choppers are coming back, man. I mean, the fuck, coolest thing I ever did is come up on a CFL thing. Yeah, I'm excited about it. I know? saw it in your shop, man. That, that's, that's a, a fucking come up. That's right there. super. I'm super excited about that one. You know, it's taking me back to where I started. So, you had built. I mean, you you post on your Instagram all the time. Like every once in a while, you throw a chopper on that you built back in the day. I mean, like how was it building choppers back then for you, at least? Um, easy, <laughs> easy. A lot less shit. That world's a lot less, a lot less complicated. Shit. A lot less. Uh, you know, fucking. Yeah, a lot less. That's all it is. Back then, we didn't have fuel injection. Yeah. We didn't have all those big wiring harnesses, man. I mean, like, we had one main 50 amp fuse that like, ran the whole thing. You <laughs> so, know, it was like, there was no wires to it, you know? So, you could do a lot more with a gas tank and build in one back then. You didn't have to have a fuel pump, uh, you know, mounted. Oh, yeah. No, it was just a fucking petcock. That was it. Yeah. So, that, yeah, it's got to be a lot easier fucking back then. Yeah. But, it, you know, like, dude, just seeing how you've evolved just from me knowing you for like what seven years now almost it's like seeing you just build you know tol up from you know just being a bag company at one point to now making frames for everybody doing you know chin spoilers and all these one-off gas tanks you know what i mean like you've you've turned it into something pretty pretty dope i mean it, smart business minded as well you know well i wasn't always very uh, smart about it because back then you know 15 years ago, 10 years ago, I was always like, fuck fiberglass, blah, blah, blah. I'm a, fucking, I'm a guy, I'm a fabricator. I'm going to fucking build nothing but steel. This thing, dumbest fucking thing. I probably would have been a little bit better off yeah. if I would have got out of that mindset, you know, and got it back into the parts business, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. I, yeah. You know, you know, I always wanted to be a guy who really built stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to build everything. And that's why, like, if you're trying to run your business and you're trying to do everything, you'll fail. Yeah. You, know, I have you, good gotta have, you gotta have you gotta have uh, people to do things. I have a good, I have an extremely good team. I have a good, good employees, good guys in the back in the office. It's it's starting to grow, and you know, trying to like like hand off stuff to people to handle things that I'm always trying to fucking shuffle so much. And when you try to sh shuffle so much, you fucking you just start failing and failing and failing, and mm -hmm. eventually you realize either you know. You're gonna fail, or you're gonna have to fucking let loose and let somebody else help you out. Yeah, that's the, that's the hard part about anything, especially when you're doing something creative, is uh, giving away some of that control and yeah. and then hoping that they do the same type of uh, quality work that you expect from yourself. Yeah, you know and what I mean? you know it's 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 good and like probably eighty percent of the time, but you know there's there's always gonna be problems. But as long as you fucking stand behind your product and you know and 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 don't you know if if you don't stand behind your product and you don't fucking address the things that are you, you've done wrong or your business has done wrong, then, you know, you deserve whatever the backlash yeah. is. What do you think about, like, how the, uh, you know, the industry, like, at least the big wheel industry, like, you know, how it's kind of more or less plateaued in where it's at now? Like, you know what I mean? Like, how do you, how do you, I mean, you make a lot of your money off selling bags to that industry. So yep. it's like... How, what are your thoughts on it? You know what I mean? As far as like where it's at or where it's going. I think it's going to be like, I think we're going to see some, I think we're going to see a big change in the next year or two. Like you're going to see a lot of people fall off this industry. People that have, are in this industry for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. Like they like want to be cool. They want to fucking like, they, like, oh, I'm a bike shop and fucking they think they're going to fucking reap rewards or hang out with fucking hot chicks and this and that. Again, for all the wrong reasons, those guys are all going to be gone because they brought no value. They they just did nothing but fucking drain their investors and this and that. Those people are going to be gone, and it's going to be the best thing that ever happened because mm -hmm. then we're going to be able to be like, oh, these are the fucking these are the good assets to the industry. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we're going. 
Yeah, that's that's kind of like the the thing that we talk about a lot too. Is uh, once you weed out all the clowns, you know what I mean? All the people that are just kind of like vultures that are just here to take and uh, rape and pillage is basically what it is. Like they just want to get what they get, and then you know. It's one thing we always say. It's like you see a dude that's here because Big Will Baggers is the popular thing to be if you have money, right? Yeah. And then then side-by-sides come along, and they got to get a big side-by-side with speakers and lift kits and this, and then boats come along. And it's like all these other facets of things, and it's like the motorcycle industry is, is one of the only things that I think that's a hobby for a lot of people, but there's a real passion and a real history of motorcycling behind it. Like – Boating is cool, but there's no fucking boat clubs from the '60s doing fucking boat shit. You know what no. I mean? It's let me tell you what the people that are going to fail in this motorcycle industry are the people who own businesses in this motorcycle industry, and they're going to work at nine, ten, eleven, twelve o'clock. Yeah, and working six, seven, eight o'clock. If they're not in there fighting the fight at fucking five a.m., they're here for the wrong reason. Yeah, they're gonna fucking they're they're like. They're, they're, they're not even, if you live on the West Coast, you better be running your business on the East Coast. Mm-hmm. That's it. Smart. If, if, if the fucking stock market opens up at nine, you better be fucking ready to open up at six. Mm-hmm. Even though we're not in the stock market, but you better be able to re- answer your phone at 6 a.m. if somebody's calling at 9 a.m. Yeah. on the East Coast. That's it. That's how it works. Mm-hmm. If you're not, you're fucking, you're lazy or you're a failure. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a it's a good way to look at it, man. Like uh, that's one thing I want to start getting into more is like being more being here for the last couple of days. I've been I found myself waking up at seven a.m. Like, on the dot. You're like, you're still, assholes leaving at five thirty in the fucking morning. Where the fuck are you going? I'm going to work. I'm waking up at seven a.m. and you've been at work for two hours. Yeah. <laughs> But hey, I will say thank you for letting me drive your uh, seven hundred. Was it seven hundred fifty horsepower? Yeah. That thing's fucking insane. Hey, man, fucking, you're my boy, dude. Fucking, dude. you're my boy. Dude, I'll never forget the fucking first time, like, we hung out. It was like, <laughs> this motherfucker put me on fucking Facebook, fucking snoring on the couch. <laughs> I was tired. I always work. Yeah, dude, we were at a Rot Rally in 2013, I think it was, and uh, we had just, you know, we were, we were kind of young in the Big Wheel Bagger uh, movement at the time, and we were all there for the Big Wheel Bagger show, uh, Baddest Bagger, whatever the case was. Yeah, it was a good time. I remember because we went back to the truck because that was when my my bike got that cover, and we were going to look at the uh, the cover sheets. Yep. And then we were just sitting in the car chilling, Sorry, I, AC, I, and I started falling asleep. <laughs> yep. And then you were like, <laughs> took a picture, and then all of a sudden I woke up, and there was all these fucking hey. notifications. I'm like, motherfucker. But, but now at your house, now I snore louder. <laughs> oh, you fucking snore. I was like, <laughs> yeah, time caught up, bro. I'm like, what's going on over there? <laughs> that is crazy, man. The, the weirdest thing about being in this world, man, and being this in this industry is seeing how it's like come and gone and evolved and seeing people that stay here, seeing people that are still creating something. And one thing that was really dope is that like, I want to say 2016, you guys at TOL like invested in, you know, the FXR and the Dyna market. Like this is when I saw the Dyna market. This is when I fell in love with it. And you guys were on top of it, creating the, uh, the uh, RT fairing and, uh, did it originally? Wasn't that fairing like going towards like uh, what was it the other company that was making one or they vacant were, house? Is that vacant house? That's right. And then something fucking went south there, huh? Yeah. And then uh, but I mean now that we're seeing a lot of these fairings on baggers more, it's like your fairing is probably the one to do it with because it's it's for the wider the wider front end. Well, so we have we have two of them. We have oh, do, do have a narrow and do, we do have a wider one for the touring models. And, and anything with a wide glide. And, um, you know, the one thing we did is we cleaned it all up underneath as opposed to a lot of the other companies. Um, it's a hard market because, you know, there, there are a lot of good guys out there producing, you know. Dude, that uh, fairing that, is complicated, man. Like, being at your shop and seeing all the molds and how many molds it takes to make the fairing and also create that quality of the, the inside of the fairing. and everything. Dude. And, um, before, it, before it leaves out the door, there's so much involved in it. Yeah. There is. And I'll tell you, I, I, there's a lot of times I'm like, man, I'm just fucking, I'm ready to fucking, like, shelve that deal. Yeah. Because it, it'll take us more time to build 
that fairing than it is to build, you know, a set of back in. No, like fucking four or five of them. You For know, real? yeah, it's it's very it's very it takes a lot of time. Yeah, you know, and you know my guys are like. You know, they're already fucking struggling and stressing to get all the orders out and this and that. And then they're having to deal with this one fairing. So a lot of times we think about, like, you know, do we want to keep it? We think about a way to build it faster, quicker, yeah. easier, less, less, uh, you know, end prep on it. You know, because yeah. when it leaves, I mean, it's it's pretty good looking. It's a super good looking piece. Yeah, it's ready to paint inside yeah. now, which is it, one it, of the only ones in our industry yeah, that it, come that way. It's a good looking piece, but, man, it just takes... It really does. At the end of the day, I mean, we really want to have a nice product before it gets to the customer. But, like, we make very, like, that's the one piece we make very little money on because yeah. we spend so much time on making it look nice before it gets to the customer. Yeah, it does seem that, you know, like I said, I, was, I saw all the molds for it. I saw that how many things have to be made and then bonded together and then body worked. It's it. You know, when you saw the price tags on a lot of those fairings, when I first got in this industry, I was like, man, fucking 2500 bucks, two grand, this, that. And then you see an OG one that's going for two grand, but that two grand is like repairing it. No, they're know, fixing even it. Like, like the guys now that are making them, like, you know, Mike and, and BMC and stuff, like, they're, like they have a top mold, a front mold, and that's it. And, you know, all they have to do is a little bit of seam work. Ours is fucking every do like inside outside this that it's like it's so much after it comes out of the mold to, to you know make it uh you know you know like ready ready for the fucking uh, for the, uh consumer. consumer yeah it's gotta be tough have you ever uh you know I remember uh Matt like the first year it was 2016 SEMA I mean uh, Sturgis. Uh, Matt had that lowrider S that y'all yep. built that fairing for, and that was like one of the, me and me and my buddy Brad were sitting there. That's when we fucking stickered up Doug Magoon shit, remember? Yeah. <laughs> and then we're all drunk asses went and ran out the hill to go to the. You guys said I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I went. I went. I went. I went over fucking back down the street to the clubhouse and hung out over there. Look, I was like, look, run, go, dude. Get we're it. fucking. We were drunk as fuck. So. I know. But uh, yeah, that was that year, and that was the year that uh, I think I, I think me, I think we brought. The diner that I had bought out there, but we it was just a stock ass diner that we had. Yeah, my, I, th I think you rode your diner all the way out there. No, well, n no, I, I rode the bagger there. So check it out. That day that we were chilling with you, we had came to your booth in in uh, Sturgis right after the uh, the custom paint show for uh, Parrots. Parrots, right? Yeah. So we showed up. We're fuck, uh, fucking Sean T. Well, let's fucking you know you had just all this fucking box full of stickers. We're just throwing stickers on everything and shit. And that was the last day I ever rode that bagger. That was the last day I rode that bagger back to the fucking house. Which bagger was it? Was that your, was the white your, one. Your white one. Yeah, yeah that was the last your day. Your big wheel bagger. It was like your one with the twenty six on it. Yeah, I rode that home, and then uh, you you know how real common on the baggers the uh, petcock uh, that'll leak. When yeah, the leak, o rings the o -ring go, bad. go bad. Yeah. yeah. So it was fucking spewing gas out. So I was like, well, guess I'm riding the Dyna. So I pulled the Dyna out the trailer, and we, me and my wife rode that around, and then I rode that home. And then as soon as I got home, I, I, I hit one of my boys up, said they wanted to buy it. And that was the last day I ever rode it. it was what, your bagger? The, or the, the bagger, yeah. Yep. Never rode it again. Um, now Brad has it, actually. <laughs> Does he? <laughs> Dude. What happened to his old bagger? He, he actually sold it and made, made, made out pretty decent on it. You know, he sold it, and then it went to some shop and uh, to somebody, and then they they had a, a turbo put on it, and then they had a fucking uh, what else did they have uh, turbo done. They put a tour pack. It's already changed hands twice, I think. You know what I mean? So it's been a fucking uh, his bagger's been around the around the block a time or two. <laughs> fucking um, oh, I just had something on my mind. I was just getting ready to say. But yeah, that was the year that uh, we finished his bike. That was the year that we had it. That it got shot for Urban Bagger. You remember the year? You remember the year? You and all your buddies. There was like, not the last time you were here, but the year before that. And you called me, and all your guys' bikes <laughs> fucking blown out shocks, yeah. and this and that. Like, I Just told this, me at the shop, dude. <laughs> I've told this story a thousand times on this podcast. So yeah, so you guys listening, this is Sean. This is the guy that. That on in the border of Arizona and New Mexico or uh, Arizona and uh, Utah, when I had an air ride shock blowout, there was I two called, of you guys. Yeah, no. So this is a story, and I'm gonna say it again. I'll, I'm sorry if you guys are sick of hearing it. So we were in Monument Valley uh, on the border of Utah and everything, and my shock blew out on my bike. And then 
we we teed it off and made one shock, you know, made it work on one shock. And then I swear to God, right in front of the exit to go to the Grand Canyon on the north and south highway from uh, Flagstaff, Brad's shock blows. So now we have two baggers with uh, air ride shocks blown. And so, hey, uh, Sean, I need you to make that order for two shocks. <laughs> and it was fucking crazy because it was like, you know, it was like three in the afternoon. We're in Flagstaff and we got to get to Vegas. And so we made it. It was a scary ass ride. It was like a Sunday, a Saturday or whatever. Yeah. And you're like, you know, oh, Sean's probably working. He always works. Yeah. So we, I mean, fortunately, man, like, like you're, you know, you, we came by, you welded up some shocks for us, made it work. And then we rode those shocks all the way home, man. It but was your real- buddy... Fucking, you guys made it all the way to State Line, California State Line. Oh, and blew yeah. Up his motor. It's right. His motor fucking blew up. So then I sent the fucking tow truck guy, Stu, yeah. out there, picked it up, brought it back. Your boy rented a fucking pickup truck and drove all the way back to Texas. Yeah, I, I tell people about this story all the time. It's like, man, it's a, it's a, when you're doing these cross country trips like this, man, like, you know, for a lot of us, we all put a lot of effort into getting the time off and affording to be able to do it. Yep. And it's like, you know, when your boy's bike breaks down, like you want to, you don't want to leave your, you don't want to leave anybody, right? No, 100%. But when you leave the house, you be like, hey, dude, if the inevitable happens, you need to be ready to be able to uh, get your shit back home and not fuck everybody else's trip up. Yeah. And I will say this, though, like that trip, it was still a great experience doing that trip, but with the homies bikes blowing up and him not making the trip it kind of put a dampener like on the the morale of the trip you know what i mean no i don't think it was that bad because it was like hey man like your shit's blowing up go back to toll fucking whatever you're gonna do fucking handle it and you guys were at least able to keep hammering you know yeah because i mean you guys probably waited a little bit but fucking you know we fucking dude came back to the shop like we were good and fucking we got him in a truck he loaded it up in the truck and he drove all the way back to texas yeah so. We, just, we just felt bad because, the, you know, our homie Vic that was the one that had the bro- the, the problems, like he was he was like the, the most enthusiastic person about the whole thing. So he was like our he was our, our our like cheerleader of the thing, I guess is the right word. Like he's the one that kept us all like, fuck, yeah, we're doing this, you know. But, dude, it was 630. Hey, you're fucking popular, dude. It's 630. And we're uh, we're sitting here, you know, 20, 10, 15 miles from the border of California. We got to make it to Livermore, right? That's our hotel for the night. Is Livermore? It's six thirty in the afternoon. All the way to Livermore. That's yeah. fucking far as fuck, dude. It, we didn't get there till four a.m. We were like, we, we. Were, I got pictures of Brad, my other buddy Chris. We were laying in gas stations, like parking lots, like ready to crash right there. Still with a hundred miles to go. Oh, out of a like hotel room. Dude, it was... It I don't was, ride like you guys, man. Yeah. Fucking, like, I, I tell everybody all the time, I'm like, fuck, I'm not a rider, bro. I have build bikes. Like, my friend, one of my best friends, Chris Madsen, that dude's a rider, bro. He, yeah. like, fucking hammer down. Hammer well, down. <laughs> good backstory, though. Um, you used to be the one dude that stayed up late every night that would talk shit to me whenever I'd, I'd put my drunken posts on, on Instagram and shit. You were Talking about night. trailer dudes. <laughs> 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 You, you send me a message at 3 in the morning like, you need to fucking calm the shit down, Jace. Not everybody's into trying to be uh, Jax Teller from Sons of Anarchy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I would laugh about that. That's right. You're like, fuck it. Because you would fucking, you would call everybody out, but even the fucking people that didn't even have it coming. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, if you have a dually, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I had a dually. <laughs> exactly. No, but it, it, it's so crazy, like, thinking back on that time, like, I was... You know, I, dude, I, I felt weird because like we were into riding bikes, and and the big wheel bagger industry was turning more into just you know, which I respect now, but it was just about building them. It wasn't about like the experience on them. You know what I mean? Yep. And so like I, I've come to realize that there is a uh, there's a really awesome balance between a builder with talent that creates a badass piece of art, and then there's that other side of it where you have a shop that. You know, most shops aren't doing what you were doing. They were just, you know, slapping the parts that you provided on their bikes and then, you know, whoring yeah. them out. Or not in a bad way, but just just saying. And then, you you know, these people weren't really, like like you said earlier, I didn't see them as being super uh, connected to the industry. I just felt like... They're not like, an asset. Yeah, I felt like all these people were just here because there was money here. And they were providing a service of, uh, you know, here to there. 
mm-hmm. and there was no there was no real connection to the culture on top of it. Right. Looking back now, I see that, but at the time, I was just like, "You you got a trailer? Fuck you!" You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, like you you know you, the thing is, you and I have been friends for a long time, and you know, you and your buddies had problems with the bike. I you know I, we, we you know I helped you out this and that, but like you know you being with me for the last you know fucking four or five days. You're like, oh, this motherfucker's up at 5 o'clock in the morning, going to work, filthy, fucking greasy, welding, fucking answering phones, yeah. fucking on the phone, computer, this, that, dictating. Like, I, I, I put a lot of fucking effort into this industry because I love my industry. I love my business. And, you know, I, like, it's pretty much all I've known for the last 25 years. Yeah, the crazy thing about sitting here on, and looking at it from this angle is, like, you know, you're a fabricator. You know, you're a creator as far as like you're you're constantly, you know, adding more, you know, parts to your line for the most part. But you're also like somebody in the in the industry um, that provides a lot of services to the normal mom and pop shop. And, you know, we've talked a lot about this is that you provide a lot of your services to shops across the country. But, you know, you're not like the first dude on, on social media going, I built that frame. I built those bags. I built this. You know what I mean? I, and I told you that today. Yeah. I don't care what people know what I do. Do not care. I don't even care. It's nobody's business who I built for fucking anybody. Like, we have a fucking, we have a business relationship. Yeah. And fucking, I do the work. You pay me. It's nobody's business who I did it for. And it's it. I don't, you'll never sit there and see me say, I didn't get no fucking notoriety for that. Nobody recognized me. I don't give a fuck if anybody recognizes me. I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. Like, I'm fucking. I I'm, guess the good part about it is that you have respect from the peers of this industry, though. Yeah, so I like, do. Yeah, I do. You earn that, though, over the, you know, 20 plus years now. Yeah, I do. Like, I go help my fucking friends all the time, but fucking. Big name celebrity people, this, that, all the time. Nobody knows. I don't give a fuck. I yeah. don't care. I don't care about any of that. Like, I know I get up every morning, bust my ass, fucking, and, and people respect me. They want my help. And I don't care if anybody knows what I do or who I do it for. I don't care because I want those people to respect me. I want them to appreciate me, and they do. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's also business, and I get paid. That's it. Well, I guess that's a good way to look at it because, like, you know, I don't know anybody in this industry that's been around for the last 10 years that doesn't know who you are and hasn't had your helping hand at some point. And it's actually comical because (laughs) on the fucking whatever Facebook or whatever the fuck it was, like, fucking a couple weeks ago, fucking somebody was, like, talking about, like, me and this and that and, like, fuck fuck this Sean who the fuck is this Sean guy and the guy's like what and I'm like they're like dude if you don't know who fucking this Sean Blitzel's guy is man like fucking dude he's like you know he's been around forever blah 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 he's this that and the guy's like what and then all of a sudden he's messaging me on fucking whatever instant message or whatever he's like dude I don't even know who you are like I don't really like honestly I don't get out there I don't want the fucking notoriety, like fucking, who am I? This, that. I don't yeah. care about none of that. Fucking, I know who my friends are in the industry. I know who, I like, I respect the people that fucking bring, like I said, a value to this relationship. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, those people think that I bring value to the relationship. That's why you keep doing I mean, relationship to the fucking, uh, to the industry. But, like, people, there's a lot of people that, like, they're not connected to the industry on a daily basis. To know that who I am, and I like that doesn't worry. Really, doesn't worry me. It doesn't. That's not. You know what? what? That that's probably one of the most eye-opening things I've had of being with you this whole week is seeing how connected to the industry you are. Like, I feel pretty privileged to know a lot of people. <laughs> you know, fucking everybody, and you're texting them while we're talking about it. You know what I mean? And it's kind of like, oh shit! Like, this is what time plus experience plus doing this stuff for twenty plus years. Uh, provides it provides so many relationships f- throughout the industry from whether it is a Dyna FXR industry or a bagger or a chopper industry it's you know a lot of a lot of the companies are the same companies the bikes may change but the companies stay the same yeah. in a lot of aspects I, like, you know? I, I laugh at like everybody there are so many fucking talented people out there that nobody knows about like yeah. nobody knows about like that like 
like the other day, you were showing me fucking, and I'm like, dude, who, like this fucking bike, who built this bike? They're like, oh, that's this fucking Luke, dude. And this, I'm like, dude, that dude's fucking amazing. Like, dude, like, yeah. set aside all the bullshit fags in this industry, that dude impresses me. Like, dude, yeah. he's fucking amazing fucking metal fucking craftsman, this and that. Dude, there's a guy that, like, like my friend Kerry and Big B are friends with from uh, Speakeasy. His name's uh, from Speakeasy Customs or something like that. Dude, kid's fucking amazing. Like, I fucking just started following him not too long ago because yeah. he became good friends with Kerry and Big B and fucking, you know, uh, Jordan Graham. All those, they became good friends. And I started following him. Like, holy fuck, this guy's fucking amazing. And it was funny because he was like, I think he was on doing the show with uh, the guys from, uh, uh, what was that, fucking American Chopper or something oh, like that. Oh, he's out there doing and stuff did. too. And I, I don't think he does anymore. But, you know, and Brendan, he's a good friend of mine uh, from Elite. He's a good friend of mine. He still goes on and does work for him, but he's a good fabricator, you know. Um, I thought that was weird how like uh, that show, you know, the the American Chopper, you know, Chopper came back on and it was the Paul versus Senior kind of thing. But everybody that I'm cool with on the industry is out there doing these bikes for them. I'm like, oh, whoa. Like, isn't it? Yeah. Is it not weird? It isn't. Like this kid that, like I said, I've I've never met him face to face or anything like that. But I know he's good friends with like Carrie and fucking uh, Big B and, you know, Jordan, all those dudes. He's good friends with them. And I've like been, I started following him recently on like social media. And the kid's fucking amazing. Fucking Was it that, there. did he do the, who did the uh, sidecar for, for Carrie? Was it him? No, no, no. Some, some high end fabricator kid that, uh, from a hot rod shop. Okay. I don't okay. even know. But that dude's fucking a stud too. But, um, this kid from Speakeasy, he like he's fucking cool, super talented. Went out there, fucking, you know, helped carry with that new bike he just built, that Indian bike, that King Killer or something like that. And um, then he also sold a bike that was like, you know, was his fucking heart and soul, fuck beautiful, fucking little crafty little fucking bike, and he sold it to Carrie's wife. And I was like, fuck, this kid's fucking so talented, and like, he brings fucking like different soul, soul to the industry, yeah. like fucking. There's the shit like you're like oh fucking there's nothing on that bike that's bolted on you ain't going to buy that shit and fucking JP Cycles drag specialties none of that shit he yeah. built every part of it and the dudes dudes a fucking like I just follow him on social media he's a fucking he's does cool shit he's a stud there's a lot of people like that man I've I've found you know and I've only found like this uh, love for the uh, fabrication side over the last like two years. And uh, you know we, you know me and you back and forth all week have been showing people we've known and shit, and it's 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 for me. Two years ago, like I was all about just riding bikes, but now I see, now that I know fabricators very closely, I, I see the passion in building a frame or building a bike, and I see that that passion is almost as equal as the same passion that I have for riding them. Yep. And so I've chilled on my trailer shit. <laughs> But at the same time, it's like I see that I see how, how like how obsessed you can be of building something badass, and how much that you know equates to how obsessed I could be about riding my bike. Do you know this? It's funny because I see this industry. I have a lot of like older friends that have been like fifty years in this industry, mm -hmm. and think about like where we are now with the bikes we have. They're you know they're super. They're they're. They are much more reliable than they were 50 years ago. But think about the guys that were driving those, riding those choppers 50, 60 years ago. And fucking, I saw a picture the other day of a fucking chopper that it was up on a fucking island of a fucking ga a gas, station, gas station and they were changing the fucking rear wheel. Think yeah. about all the shit those people went through when they were riding, going fucking, oh, we're going to fucking jam to fucking Purdue and fucking this, that. And their shit's, everybody's shit's breaking down. Yeah. But they're all fixing it on the road. It was a different culture, man. It yeah. was a culture that like, uh, you know, I think about this a lot. I talked to a lot of friends that uh, try to live in that world that doesn't exist anymore, but it's still pretty cool to yeah. hang out with them. Oh, but I, I, I know I'm not, I would never adapt to it. I know, I know for Dude. a fact I wouldn't. Like, there's a lot of fucking bad dudes that do it now. We've been, we've been, we've been sharing pictures of like cool ass choppers that we both would like to have over yeah. the last couple of days. And I do want one. You know, I've fucking, I've been saying this for years, but I, I do want one. And now that I see that this style is making a resurgence, pretty hardcore from what I've seen, is like the the West Coast chopper style and that shit you showed me from Paul Tracy today or uh, Paul. Uh, 
Big uh, fuck. What's the other Paul in Arizona? Oh, Yaffe. That Yaffy. fucking gold fuck. bike. That so Suzuki they, bike. That gold bike was sick as fuck. I'm like, oh. when did Paul build this? You're like, 2005. I was like, fuck. Dude, that bike was bad as fuck. Dude, that bike was one of my favorite dude. bikes. Dude, dude that's, the, that's what I grew up on was but, that bike. But what's cool about those bikes now that I'm looking back is I'm looking past all the clown shit. Oh, yeah. I'm looking past the clown shit, and I'm seeing some of these really talented fabricated bikes that were built by you know people that 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 you know maybe in this new world right now aren't getting the credit they deserve for the shit they built because there's all this fucking you know bullshit in between you know all this fucking like flamboyant fake ass biker culture shit that's in between it you know yeah 100 percent, 100 the fucking the guy introduced you at the gas station yeah. thing, my friend kenny that dude to this day, you like, hey, I'm jumping on my FX armor and fucking roll the fucking Sturgis that, today. And, and tell me what you said. That's the dude that has the uh, he has a full fairing FXRT on a fucking pedestal in front of his shop, Boulder Choppers. Right? At, like fucking thirty feet up in the air. I remember that dude when he put it up there. Like everybody went crazy because it was like shit that everybody wanted to buy. Dude. And he just threw it up on a fucking pole. He was one of my fucking closest friends here in Vegas. <laughs> and dude, he's fucking funny. That was like when you were in the gas about. Is that fucking Dude, I walk out of the gas station. You're like, "Hey, is that Kenny?" I don't know. He looks. He's about to shoot that bitch up. <laughs> <laughs> and he's so fucking like he's not even that guy nor he was, but he's such a good dude. Like fucking, cool. well, he's one of my closest fucking homies here in town. Yeah, it's crazy. Like 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 Vegas itself doesn't seem like this big ass like city. It, it, you're a city in the middle of fucking nowhere, dude. It is fucking so much shit going on. But yeah. guess what? I never fucking. I never even. I never even jump into the middle of it. Dude, I'm either at fucking work or I'm yeah. at home. Work, home, work. I get out there once in a while, but I'm at work or at home. That's it. Yeah. I, I, dude, I've been a part of your schedule. <laughs> I don't know how you eat at the same restaurant every day. <laughs> it's I, easy though, right? At 9 o'clock when you're going home, dude, you go home, you get a fucking <laughs> couple of drinks. It's my fucking sleeping medicine. It is a good point, man. I, like, I never said it as my sleeping medicine, but I'm the same way. I'd come home. I have like a couple beers. I'd, I'd be on the computer on the fucking you know markers trying to draw some sketches and it clears my mind enough to focus on something yeah, I have no desire I have no desire to go run anywhere I don't want to go to that bar over on that side of town this that I go to the place they all like me they, I like them they respect me like fucking I eat I have a couple of drinks fucking go home go to sleep it's like, almost like seeing your same friends routine, every night yep same routine every night the fucking you know they're fucking they're good people they fucking treat me amazing you know fucking it's a just it's a good atmosphere it's a, you know what you know what you eliminate by doing this man where do i want to go eat tonight what do i want to do today I'm like i'm just hey leave work go here have a have a have a couple beers a shot food go to go home go, go to, to bed sleep. get up yeah. back up at the same time tomorrow yeah. morning five o'clock in the morning make sure i'm at work no later than six <laughs> same routine every day and i do it six seven days every fucking day i work seven days a week mm-hmm. i'm always in that shop the only time i don't work is if i'm out of town that is it yeah well man like ever since i've known you've always provided a, a quality product for us and, and and not even that man like you've always like just just you know us as shops and all across the country we, we got our ups and downs of running businesses and it's like Oh man, this happened. It's like you've always been accommodating, you know, in one one way or another. You know what I mean? It's like it's always square business, though. You know what I mean? Like, hey, you know, I need this, and you're 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 down. But it's it's awesome having a company that may seem like a huge huge entity from the outside looking in, but you sit, you call, you answer the phone, or you pick it up, or you answer this, or you get it out. One hundred percent. Every I, I was telling you that today at, at dinner. I'm like. Everybody fucking thinks like, you know, even though my business does well, but everybody thinks that like there's this person, that person, there's this part of the business. I'm like, no, I'm the fucking toilet cleaner. I'm the fucking check writer. I'm the fucking whatever. I'm fucking all of them. The welder, the assembler, the fucking builder. I'm every bit of that fucking industry. I mean, I'm sorry, that business that is that that the, the foundation of it, though I have a great, like I said, a great team. Whether it's in the office with Christina, Sheila, fucking over in the back with my guys, like I have a great fucking like foundation. But 
I'm not afraid to go fucking clean the toilet. If the shit's all fucked up in the toilet, I'm going to go clean the toilet. Yeah. If I'm fucking, if I got to go mop a floor, I got to clean the shop, fucking, I, I do it Dude, all. Dude, you've been accommodating to me all week. I'm running across trying to pick Dude. up tape and all this, that, and the other. Dude, like, I'm fucking, I got it there. Like, the first day you got done, I'm like, fuck, I can get there fucking early. Get that fucking shit hole cleaned up, man. Dude, it was fucking, <laughs> it was horrible when you got done. I was like, fuck, I was like, Cleaning it up, man. Fuck, I get this fucking shit cleaned up, dude. This fucking shit, you could be stepping over fucking crap. It's the weirdest thing. It's like, it's, it's what's crazy about owning a business is the like, sweeping floors to me is almost therapeutic at times. It's the most simple job in my business. But while I'm, you know, like for me, I have a paint booth, so I got to sweep it out every once in a while. But while I'm in there sweeping that floor, it, it's centering. It's almost like fucking yoga. You know, it's like, I'm going to be here for about 10 minutes. This is how long it's going to take me to sweep this floor. I, there's nothing I'm going to do that's going to make it go quicker. Nothing gonna make, nothing I can do to make it slower. It's just, I'm just going to do it, and I'm here, and I'm in the motions. And then when I get done, it's just it's therapeutic at some points to me. And I remember I said this year, I was like, you know what? My New Year's resolution this year is I'm going to try to keep my fucking shop clean. I'm going to try to... You know, I got a lot of shit going on in my shop, but I'm going to try to keep it clean and pick shit up and sweep and this and that. And I had my buddy from Harley the other day. He came over because he needed some parts for some work he was doing for me. Not Mike, but Rob. And he goes, he goes, I know this is going to be a fucking nightmare. He goes, but this is the list I need right here fucking to finish this job for you. And this, yeah. I'm like, oh, really? I walked over to my toolbox, pulled it open. I go, here you go. It is all fucking right there. He looked at me, he goes, fuck's wrong with you man like dude you, you're always a fucking mess seven days a week and now you're all fucking organized yeah. i like this is my new year's resolution it wasn't <laughs> quit drinking it wasn't this it wasn't that it was like get more organized inside my shop dude organization is the key to anything successful man like fuck when, you know like when you walk into your like you, you know you do a lot of tig welding i've been watching like you do you know a lot of chin spoilers that you make and things like that and they're all they're all done by hand you know what i'm saying and it's like it's a process. It's a it's a process of having your tools readily available, working properly, uh, a place to sit, a place to operate, and it, it's just a it's just a process, you know. Keeping a clean workflow in a shop is like one of the key things of making things, you know, productive and, and profitable. Yeah, fucking searching for tools, searching for this or that wastes so much time. Yeah, and you know when you waste time, you wait. You know it's like you're losing profit. Like it legitimately is. If I must spend fucking. If I spend an hour a week fucking searching for shit, I've done lost 200 bucks. Yeah. So that's how it works. And, you know, I would, it's, I have not fucking perfected it yet, but I'm trying to get better with it. And um, I, I try to, like, get my shit a little more organized with my tools and this thing. I mean, fuck, I expensive fucking tools, toolboxes, all that shit. And you'd think I'd be a little bit better than what I am. But, you know, it's gotten better over time. You know, I fucking, the one thing I can say is, like, fucking, from when I started to where I am now, you know, like, I've done, you know, I remember when I was broken, I had nothing. And now I have fucking good tools, good equipment, all that stuff. So it makes it, it does make it nice. Yeah, it's like when you, uh, at least if you're looking for your shit, you're looking for quality tools and not like some shit that might also not work. You yeah, know I get mean? upset if my shit's fucking missing. I'm like, fuck that fucking thing, it was a hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah, man, it's a, it's a fucking shit show. But another, another funny thing I've been seeing on social media lately is like a lot of, uh, a lot of memes been going around about like, uh, people's time in the industry and their value as a shop. And, you know, I, I, I've done this for, you know, 30,000 hours and that's why I get this money or, you know, whatever the case, I don't even fucking, I've been drinking. I saw it the other day too. But it's like, you know, we were talking about tonight about how like you've had people, you know, that'll reach out to you wanting you to build a frame and build all this crazy shit and you just, you you hit them with a price and that price is a a thought out price that you know that you can provide the quality product or the quality service that you provide. But it's a sticker shock for a lot of people. Yeah, but they're going, like, it's, they're going to be safe. They're going home to their wife, their kid, their family. They're like, whatever. I'm giving you a product that, like, some of the you biggest builders come to me for because they know that it's soundproof. But I'm going to make sure you're you're going home to your wife and your children every night. Yeah. Like, if you go out and you're riding hard and this and that. And I was like, dude, you get on this bike, fucking get up there, do 130 miles an hour, you're gonna be good, just fine. You're going home safe. Yeah. And that's it. And that's what I tell them. And they're like, well, I can go here and this. I'm like, hey, man, you gave me a list of fucking four fucking people. I'll tell you what, 
go to these two. Those two, I fucking recommend. The other two, nah, no, no good. That's it. Because there are good dudes out there that build nice stuff. Yeah. Build good frames. Trustworthy. You know? Um, there are also fucking dudes out there that fucking, their shit's being built. I mean, built think about it. Like, there. how many, like, if, if you're wielding up a frame and, and someone's life is on it, like, you really only get one shot at that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you don't right. get, like... What kind of what kind of quality control? I can't put out what three are you doing shitty custom are you paint jobs. It? Are, yeah. are you cleaning your metal before you start welding? Are you fucking? Are you fucking? You know? Are you wiping everything down? Are you sandblasting? Getting all the pro, getting all the imperfections out of it? Are you fucking? You know? Cleaning it all up with acetone before you weld? Are, are you doing everything to prevent failure? Yeah. No, you're just fucking throwing the shit together. You know? Anybody that I see that is building bikes, like. Five bucks a month, three bucks a month, four bucks a month. There are ones that are production, but people that are building like these, like these high-end bikes, whether they look like fucking catastrophes or they look good. But if you're doing fucking, th- if you're doing three of them a month, like, like, dude, there's gonna be a problem. Yeah, you're fucking slapping the shit together. And there's, you know, there's a builder out there that I used to watch. I'm like, how is this guy getting all these bikes done? And it's only him. I'm like, fucking, I don't get it. Like. Like, I'm struggling to do fucking three bikes a year. Fucking yeah. struggling. Like, fucking, like, you know, I get high money for bikes, but, like, I am not going to fucking push them out. Like, my customers know, like, they'll be done when they're done. Like, yeah. I had one new customer this year. Um, we had a, we had a fucking, we had a fucking date we wanted to be done with, and I'm so fucking past it. Like, it's not even funny. But he's also saw, like, uh, he's coming to town, he's fucking this. He saw it, and he knows that every bit of the bike, nobody has. And that's what he told me. He's like, you know what, Sean? I know I was a fucking dick, you know, a couple times by the day. He goes, but I know that when this bike's delivered to me, it's not going to break down on me. You're gonna, it's going to go and do, you know. Whatever you wanted to do. Yeah, whatever you wanted to do. I know that you have fucking, you, you did every bit of it. And he goes, and that's why, like, he said, I used to do two bikes a year, three bikes a year, and I'll never do it again. He goes, I'll do one bike a year with you every year, one bike a year. That's it. So that's all you need. Like, because I must tell him, I told him, I'm like, Listen, I like I make good money on the bikes that I build. They're they're the they're 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 more they're not fucking sixty seventy thousand dollar bikes. They're more than that, but nobody has one like it. Yeah, nobody like nobody nobody built a bike like I built like fucking like like if you were to take the seat off, it's nothing like it. If you fucking were to look at the frame, nobody's like it. It's what he told me. He's like when I first started building this frame, he goes, dude, is that any fucking is any of that bike still a 2019? I'm like, yeah, a little bit of it, you know? <laughs> and he uh, he was just like, fuck, man. I've never fucking dealt with somebody that, like, legitimately, like, gave me a bike that, like, everything is fucking different. Yeah, that, that's got to, that's, that's the goal, though. I mean, like, if you, you know, a lot of people want to be bike builders, but a lot, of, I think a lot of shops or a lot of individuals find uh, comfort in service and the other aspects of, like, you know, I hate to say the word in, in a way that's like derogatory, but you know, that more cookie cutter, like I'm going to buy these bags, this, this, and this, and slap it on. Those I mean, are the guys that made good money. Yeah. I, I, like, I cannot knock Those them. Those are the guys I that make money. I cannot knock them because I've, yeah. I've watched some of my, some of my fucking buddies that own fucking, have done so well in this industry and you know, they've made so much money. But you know what, dude? Like, like, like that's them. Good for them. Like, they fucking, like, I fucking, I envy all the fucking see, money they've made. But they, like, walk upstairs, boom, 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 grab this, grab that. They have a parts list. They come down with a fucking big bucket of parts. And they go down. They're like, mock this up, send it to paint. And, dude, in, like, four weeks, they got a fucking finished product. And they've made 30 grand, 40 grand, 50 grand. But that's They're the thing. They're smarter like, than me because. That's, a, that, that's, that's the fundamental difference between, not between anything in, in a way that I'm saying that's bad but there's two ways of making it like there's that like very upper echelon builder where you're getting a very high-end guy that's put a lot of years and experience into building a bike to get exclusive like like attention to your build or if you're going to a shop then you know it's part of the motions of what they do as building bikes not saying that one's better than the other one's a little bit more creative one's a little bit more you know i there's no nice word to say it. I, I'm not trying to sound bad, but like more cookie cutter. Yeah. You know? Listen, there are, th- I'm going to give you a name of three builders. Uh-huh. Three builders. And I'm going to say 
or 90, 80% of the people in the current uh, industry have absolutely zero idea who they are. Well, everybody knows who Matt Hotch is because he's mm. just Matt. Yeah. But there's Matt, there's fucking, there's Roger Goldhammer, and then there's fucking Aaron Green. Those three fucking guys, I'm going to tell you what. Nobody's ever built shit like these guys, three dudes have built. Like yeah. from fucking Aaron Green and his fucking, his bikes that like everything from the motor, everything, nobody has it. Roger Goldhammer, single cylinder fucking supercharged fucking uh, bike. Dude, nobody's ever built like that. Matt's bikes, his fucking, yeah. you know, his Vincent, this, that. Nobody, nobody, nobody comes to the table with fucking motorcycles like this now. Nobody. Yeah. I can't even think of anybody that brings what these fucking guys brought to us when I was fucking, gr- like, growing in this industry. Do you think it might be uh, hard for somebody, like, like, the chopper thing is not, like, we've been talking all week and we feel like it's a resurgence coming. And we think, we see the fucking... Like, I've seen so many big wheels that, like, when I see that fucking West Coast Chopper sitting in your lift, I'm like, dude, I'm excited for this. Dude, you know I'm what I mean? so excited. Right? <laughs> dude, I'm so excited. Bro, I just fucking, I just, I just acquired a fucking CFL frame, bro. Fucking, for like, crackhead nothing, shit. Nothing. Zero. Nothing. Fucking then, Vegas, man. Like, and then I hit up Jesse this morning to get a fucking uh, uh, MSO for it because the chick didn't have the MSO. He's like, yeah, Bob, fucking tab it. He'll give it to you. I'm like, oh, dude, this shit's going to be a fucking, this build's going to be amazing. <laughs> dude, amazing. You, There's not a fucking penny you can fucking, there's no much money you give me because I'm going to build that bike. Just like dude. fucking the dude, your boy from fucking, uh, from um, uh, the, the kid, the fucking, the welder kid. They just did that bike that oh, you painted. Oh, uh, the fucking Royal T. Oh, that fucking CFL yeah. was amazing. Yeah. Dude, there, there's this weird thing. Like, I'm, I'm like, I'm looking at a lot of my homies, you know, even my buddy Carlos. He used to work at fucking uh, West Coast Choppers, too. He's done a, a few things here and there. And, like, the more I'm seeing people, and especially talking to all my homies that were on that Chopper Dogs thing and, and seeing, and, like. Chopper Dogs. That was the yeah. one that you brought up the other day. Dude, so, that's, thinking about all these people that were building these Jason, West Coast Chopper. Like, Jason, Jason's going to be fucking, he's going to be here forever. Yeah. He's going to be here forever, just like you and I. Fucking, dude, Coldy Children's going to be here forever, dude. Ever. Yeah. Those guys. They're all fucking, dude, they're badasses that bring so much to this industry. There's a guy that's fucking back in, I think he's in Ohio or Indiana. I just sent him uh, some stuff to do some work for me. But his name is Freddie uh, Freddie Shepard from Misfit Skinny Customs. Oh, the dude, guy? Yeah. Like, dude, he's a, he's a seat dude. He's an engraver. Dude, there's a lot of cool engraving out there. Like, there is. There's a lot of cool, like you said, lowrider. But I showed you his shit the other day. Mm-hmm. And it's so raw and, and fucking so... Uh, uh, like, there's nobody doing that kind of stuff. Like, dude, yeah. like, the first time I it's saw It's way guy, more deeper. It's way deeper, more sculpted. Personable. Yeah. No, no, like, everything I've ever saw this guy do, nobody has it. Like, uh, like uh, there's no two people that have his stuff. Yeah. And it's so fucking awesome. Like, I've never been more excited to, like, finish up, like, Chris's bike. And it's going to have that stuff on there. When I do the CFL, I'm going to have him do some stuff. Like, that dude right there, that dude is a... Is so it's so artistic and creative that like he's the guy twenty years from now is gonna be here doing the cool shit. Yeah. Yep. Man, I I hope twenty years from now I'm fucking here doing some cool shit. So it's one of those deals, man. Like it's a uh, it it you know we you know we did a podcast. Uh, I think probably the the one before this last one we released was with Cody Childress, and we were talking. We talked a lot about like uh, you know his upbringing, uh, upbringing in this this culture and being influenced by Jesse James and all that stuff. And then uh, we were talking about like the the hamsters and shit. You know we were you know and I had like so many people reach out to me like who the fuck are the hamsters? Like there's a lot of people in the dyna culture and shit that never heard of these people, right? Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of great great fucking dudes like fucking Arlen S. Fuck, there's nothing better than that man. Yeah. That man, fucking him, and fucking Donnie Smith. These are all original dudes. Yeah. Fucking Dave Perowitz. Those guys, they're they're the fucking guys who are the foundation of the motorcycle industry. But there's also a bunch of fucking like fucking. It's, it's so we- it's so weird though. Like we think about bikes. Like we think about everything in our life, and we don't ever think about like oh yeah, like 30, 40 years ago there was not this. You know we're so used to our our thirty forty our- years. Yes, we did. We well, had, I mean, we yes, had our own nest. We had our own nest. What I'm saying is, like, for my generation, yep. all right, so we think, like, 
you know, uh, you know, you think about everything that this world's built on. You think about like our fucking constitution and all this fucking political shit and everything. And like, oh, it's been around for hundreds of years. But then you think about like uh, motorcycling, right? You see, you know, all the club shit that's taken place over the last, you know, almost hundred years now, from the forties to now. And then you 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 see the bike building thing, and you really didn't see anything crazy with bike building or or like bike builders until like the David Mann shit started popping up. And the well, it uh, wasn't trendy. It wasn't trendy, exactly. Well, we didn't but have, then, we didn't have social media. We didn't have Discovery Channel or magazines. Magazines, yeah, you know. So when you start looking at it now, and you you think back, and you you think of the you know Ness in the seventies building this crazy outlandish shit, you know who was in the mecca of chopper culture, you know, and then you think of, you know, David Mann and all the, the El Forestero type shit that was going on in the Midwest. And, you know, there's a lot of crazy culture that was taking place. And it's hard, it's so weird as a motorcyclist to think about our forefathers of this motorcycle custom industry and also think that, oh, yeah, I have Dave Parents' cell phone number. I can text him real quick. It's like saying, I'm going to text George Washington and say, hey, dude, thanks for the Constitution or the fucking government or whatever the hell he did. I'm, I'm not that smart. Oh, dude, I remember <laughs> the first time I met Dave fucking whatever, 15 years ago. And it, yeah. was, it was me. It was fucking Perowitz. It was fucking Mondo from Denver Choppers. And it was fucking just like, dude, Paul Cox. Yeah. Like, dude. 99% of the dudes in this fucking industry don't know who the fuck Paul Cox is but fuck guess what that motherfucker he's he one was, of the he's what was the, his deal though he was Indian Larry's dude right yeah he was his guy 100% his guy yeah yeah and, and so fucking, like, a, like and Kano Kino and all those guys they yeah. were fucking don't, but those guys are also again those guys are the guys getting up in the morning fucking greasy filthy welding grinding the, dude they are not the fucking the, 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 like I said, the fucking, the, the crap of this industry. They, we never had that back then. We yeah. never did. Like fucking, you know, we, back in the chopper days, we never had fucking, like, I can never remember, like, I'm not going to bring up names, but I'm going to say I can never remember people in our industry that were like, you're like, oh, God, the guy's just such a fucking homo with his homo shirt and his fucking this <laughs> and that. You know, like, we never fucking had that back then. We never did. Never. Yeah. Never. Yeah, motherfuckers probably didn't like each other, but they'd go back and box. Yeah. Back then. That's not like that now. Yeah, for sure. You know, so, <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, it was much different, like I said, many years ago. But, it, you know, it is weird. Like, you know, I, I remember Paul Cox whenever, you know, Indian Larry was still running around. And fortunately, I was in the motorcycle industry in my very small aspect of it when he was still alive. And I remember seeing Paul Cox with Indian Larry all the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the only reason I fucking know who that dude was, you know, because, you know, because of all the biker build offs and all the TV shows and that's that and the magazines at the time, because that was our source of uh, news back then, you know, but but it is weird, like being able to look at people like Ness and, and, and you know, Billy Lane and all these people that were in our generation and be like, OK, these dudes they cult they cultivated a culture to what we all are living by now so when we think about our industry our, our motorcycle culture and our industry we think about it's not even a culture anymore <laughs> there's not there's no there's no uh, fucking we get tested that yeah yeah there's sure. nothing it's not like it say, was. when you think it like when you think of like before the jesse james era if we could say it was his era when you think before that it really just was like Perowitz and and the hamsters and all these people from the ni- early nineties and eighties and seventies. That was it. There was no other. It, w- it wasn't like now where we we had like the the chopper thing that that spanned into the bobber thing that spanned into the bagger thing that has now spanned into like I don't even know if I would say it spanned into, but has cultivated the Dynas, the FXRs, the fucking you know performance motorcycles that are taking place. Like we're still fucking super infant in our culture of motorcycles and creativity and, and building custom bikes. So, I, like, like, whatever, 15 years ago, fucking, we'd go to the dealer trade show back mm-hmm. in Cincinnati. It was so fucking big. It was so big. Like, yeah. there's, it would be like two fucking halls. It was so big. I don't even, it's been so many years since I've been there. I heard it's small. It, but, it doesn't exist anymore. But, but every year, somebody showed up with something new, cool, 
Like everybody was like they they look forward to going to see. It was what, the SEMA of the motorcycle. Yeah, thing. like what is the what's the new thing coming? Like, dude, Jesse Jones, a fucking le- dude. Listen, fucking legend air ride. Yeah, legend air ride. It was fucking air ride for your fucking motorcycle. It was the fucking first thing I fucking I'll never forget when I bought my very first one at the dealer trade show. And fucking, I bought it from Jesse, and which is he's become a very close friend of mine now. But it was the it was the coolest thing I ever fucking bought. I'm gonna have fucking air ride in my fucking salt fail. Yeah. Fuck, nobody's got it, but I'm gonna have it. Yeah. I'm gonna have that fucking air ride. And you know what? I'll never forget buying it and putting it on and building these motorcycles and this and that. And it was like, but that was the coolest thing ever to have air ride, like yeah. air ride your bike. Well, nowadays it's like. Who's got the baddest fucking most fucking rideable suspension? Who's got the Revo A? Yeah, that all that. <laughs> and Jesse's in that now, and you have the fucking you know the Olin's everything. Yeah. The Olin's, you have all that shit. You know, Russ Wernamount. He's got some. I heard he's got some yeah. badass suspension. My buddy Mark from Texas Performance and putting his shit to the test. Yeah, and uh, you know, fucking dude, right? I, another name that has fucking that has built this industry is Russ Wernamount. For real, dude, Russ Wernamount. Was the guy who fucking built all of Jesse's fucking fenders in the beginning, dude? I will say this in all honesty: the the first time I heard about that guy was when he started making those fenders that were in drag, and we were talking about it. It was like, but before that, he made all of Jesse James fenders. I didn't, yeah, and no then, dude, clue. And, and you know, I, I probably shouldn't talk about this story, but we laugh about it because he's like, he goes, yeah, you know. I used to fucking make his fenders and I would drop all these fenders off every fucking week up in Long Beach to him, this and that. And then it would be like a fucking fucking box of cash underneath. I'd pick the cash up, this and that. He goes, and the last time I left fucking a bunch of fenders there, there was no money. That was the last time I got paid. <laughs> he told me that. So I was like, what? And he There's goes, no, yeah, but it was cool. The more I've been doing this podcast, the more I've heard about people that didn't get paid <laughs> yeah. at the end of that shit. So... Uh, it's all good. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. But Russ Wernamount, dude, I'm going to tell you. Yeah. He, he builds amazing fenders. And, you know, he has, you know, he has, I think he still has stuff that comes from overseas, but all his fenders are still made, I think, still back in Michigan. And uh, is it, is, where's he out of originally? He's, 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 in, he's in Southern California. He's down in Mariana. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Temecula. He's in Temecula. Oh, and Fucking dirt bike capital. But, but the, his, his, uh, his big thing is uh, off-road. Mm. Off road racing and stuff like that. So, uh, Russ, <laughs> what's funny is, is like you think about all these people again that are super big names in the industry. And Russ is a huge fucking name in our motorcycle industry. But Russ is in there working his fucking ass up every day, doing like what you saw, yeah. how I work every day, and this and that. Like, Russ is the same guy. But he's like, like you take fucking toll and toll's like right here. And then Russell's word about yeah. is like way up here. Well, that's because like, I think that a lot of us like toll with what the big wheel world was or is. And like, like we are all like the, the direct ambassadors for our like specific culture that we're providing for. Yep. Right. But there's a lot of people in the background that are just building shit for all of the cultures. Yeah. And so, like, I think for a lot of us is that we all get into the industry as being, like, we're niche based to here. But the smarter guys, they get off that niche and they start thinking broader and broader and more different types of bikes and more different types of shit. Well, the smart ones were the ones that started making parts. Yeah. The ones that were smart, that didn't care about the image. Mm -hmm. They didn't care about fucking... They didn't care about like what people thought of them or how creative they were. They're the ones who started making parts and parts and parts. But and I will parts. say that I saw a lot of people that that like made their whole life's goal about making parts, and mm-hmm. but they didn't have any integrity in their business to back up the parts. Well, there might be some people. That you're 100 percent right. I mean, I don't know who. who like, I mean, think about, think about like Arlen Ness. I I was to his original shop. Yeah. And Hayward as original shop. And dude, I was like, gotta be down the street from Sims, huh? It was, it was. and it was like, I, but, but I remember the very first time when I lived in Detroit, and I went out there, and I was like, this is our fucking Arlen Ness's place. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> like it was like a little fucking spot, you know, fucking. Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. Well, now you know he's in a huge ass place. And then when I left there, I went up the road and I fucking I met I met met Ron Sims the very first time I met Sims Ron. is a good dude. Yeah, very first time I met Ron Sims. Like Ron Sims is a huge foundation, like. I was just saying to his kid not too long ago that uh, he, 
you know, fucking when when he showed up to a fucking show, Sturgis, Daytona, this that, and he had that fucking rig, and he pulled out fucking fifteen fucking motorcycles yeah. and the setup. There, there will never be another fucking Ron Sims. The Dude, fu- the fucking presence so of Ron Sims was fucking the coolest thing. I remember. I remember when I was younger, I'd look at him like, holy I'm, fuck, the- and Ron just sitting there, fucking, fucking. Just gangsters fuck, shared yeah. gangsters fuck, and you were like, <laughs> "Hey, hey, my Ron Sims." I'm so up. yeah, the the way, how I met Ron Sims was, uh, you know, being up in NorCal, you know, with our mutual friend. Yeah, I guess air quotes, and uh, so Paul Tracy hit me up and goes, "Hey man, my boy Ron Sims is looking for a painter up there. You know, I know you're up in NorCal all the time doing work, so go see him." So I went over there and saw him, and I was like, you know, talking to him, he showed me a shop, told me what he's doing. I was like, "Yeah, cool I know place, you are. cool shop." I was like, "I know you are, dude. You don't have to fucking give me that spiel. Like, yeah. I, I know who you are. Like, I'm honored to be here. You know what I mean?" And then I was like, "Yeah, I'm doing work up here with so and so," and he's like, "Yeah, I don't fuck with him." <laughs> <laughs> so and he straight told me right to dude, my face like, he goes like hey, the he goes, most straight face yeah. ever ever like dude like, like no hesitation dude like, like he's like the most <laughs> fucking like straight like gangster fucking like dude yeah and and and, and better was he's like fuck him <laughs> yeah, exactly I was like you know I love my boy up there to death you know but at the same time it's like he uh he just said hey you know man like like nothing against you but man like I, I don't fuck with that dude and uh you know if you're working with him, like I can't fucking work with you. And I'm like, I, I, I guess I respect that, you know, but it was just cool. It's like, you know, there's the way I look at it now in hindsight, thinking about like, man, like there's a lot of people that need to be more like that. You know what I mean? Need to be more like loyal to who the fuck they consider themselves to be. Yeah. hundred you know percent. I mean, like hundred percent. Like I said, all those people that we just talked about are the ones who built this industry. They and like, still they're here. been loyal. Like, listen, a lot of us have changed, and yeah. I went from choppers to these bikes and the billet and this and that. Dude, the Ron Sims is still Ron Sims. Yeah. Like, even he pulls up, I think it's, it's still I Ron think Sims. It's, we'd be in Laughlin. <laughs> we'd be in Reno. I'm like, I think it's, it's a little bit, it, it's a little bit unfair for these California motherfuckers, right? Because they got this culture of FXRs, right? Yeah. It's just always been there. And yeah. they and most of them were doing this shit in the 90s and early 2000s and even even throughout all the different types of genres of bikes that were popular. But now that FXRs are the most, or not the most, but one of the most popular things across the platform, all these motherfuckers in California, these Ron Sims and these fucking this and this that, they just get to be like, oh yeah, we, we, we've been into that. Yeah, we, we've been like, doing we, that. We've shit. been over here fucking dealing with all you fucking idiots for the last fucking ten fucking years. Welcome to the real world. Yeah, we've been we've been back here laughing at you guys for the last ten fucking yeah. years, and like, okay, you know. I'm still here doing what I was doing 10 years ago. <laughs> that's, 15 that's, years, 20 years that's ago. That's the funniest thing in the world. But like the, like the Daytonas and the Sturgis's dude, when fucking, when his rig would show up, it would be like, holy fuck, look at that. There's a fucking rig and those motorcycles and this and that and his kids. And so it was like, you were around whenever the rig thing started to happen though, huh? Oh so dude, Matt, what was that fucking like? Matt with the crime rig and Joe and all those dudes. All, yeah, dude. It's like everybody had to fucking have a big ass rig. It was like it was crazy. There was a lot of big. Do you think that, you think all that shit like took away from what it was to be a bike builder and a bike shop, or do you think? Uh, it... No, I don't think I don't. No, I don't know. I think everybody wanted a rig, but not everybody could. Yeah, get one because was it like the next like like fuck the the like there was a like this checklist of being a badass bike builder. It was like get a magazine, get a Discovery Channel spot, get a rig. Yeah, dude, have parts. Like, all my buddies, like fucking, like I said, Matt and all my buddies from Crime Inc. and shit, the Joe and all those guys, yeah. those fucking dudes, they had that big ass rig, dude. And But they set it up right. I mean, they'd show up, set up, open up the fucking shit, apparel. Like, it was fucking, it was, it was everything to market to the industry. Like, those guys were, them dudes were all making fucking big fucking money on yeah, apparel. Dude. Like, me, I've, I've legitimately, like, fucking, I probably have spent, in the last six years, fifty thousand dollars on apparel and probably sold a hundred bucks worth, dude. Because I fucking <laughs> like you I got to start trading guys for free shirts. Like, nah, nah, I'm fucking, I'm fucking. I act like I'm a millionaire and I'm not. You know, fucking. Yeah. It's like 
It's like, fuck. Well, that's the problem. Is like, same thing with me. Is like, when I make shirts and I haven't done it in fucking two years. But because you I do, give them away. Because I just, I feel like I owe somebody a shirt all the time. Like, yeah, dude. Like, dude, my, the, 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 my office chick, she's like, she got that shit on lockdown. Like, fuck, I got to fucking like hook, weave and this and that to get a fucking sweatshirt for myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's like weird because I was like, fuck, man, this dude gave me a shirt like two years ago. I like owe him one. Yeah, and then, or you know, like I was at Ramjet the other day, and he gave me two shirts. I was like, you know, if I wasn't on a bike trip, I'd probably pay for these shirts. You know what's <laughs> funny? Fucking when I was in Arizona, I haven't seen Tony. I think since uh, Arizona last last year. And I walked up, and I went. I was like, "Hey, am I with this shirt? This shirt?" And Tony went to go get him. I was like, "Hey, bro, here you go." I like, dude, like, yeah. I like. Don't be me. Like, don't, don't like, like, I came here, a good like, I came here to fucking support. Yeah. That's it. And then Tony was laughing. He's like, okay, well, you paid for three. Here's two. And he's like, Tony's fucking. Dude. Uh, dude, Tony, fucking him and his father, that business, there's not dude. a, there'll never be a better fucking aftermarket shop than fucking Ram Jack. Ever. So I, I text Tony, you know, when we finished this bike that we were working on here. Yep. I, I text him. I was like, hey, I might just drop down to Phoenix tomorrow and do this. I hit Tony up in last year right around the uh, Tucker Rocky dealer show and he was like hey man I'm in town I'm like I'm in town and like it didn't work out we didn't get to do him on the podcast right then he was here for the Tucker show three or four weeks ago and shook his hand high five let's let's meet tonight and then shit happened we couldn't meet then I'm like hey dude I'm coming to Phoenix I'm here in Phoenix I stopped by a shop he has you know, his wife was like, I guess his wife's pregnant or something like that. Yeah, but the thing is, is Tony, like, he's, he's a, a busy family dude, man. man. Dude, he's a busy man, but he's a family man. And dude, look look what he's done with his business. That fucking Ramjet has been the same location for many years. And believe me, like I said, yeah, I be, I, I'm not saying this because we're in, like, I tell everybody and anybody there's not a better aftermarket shop than Ramjet. Because when I first time I went to Ramjet was. Maybe 15 years ago, Sheila and I went into Arizona, and I fucking went to Ramja. I was like, dude, look at this fucking place. And it was, like, fucking raw. Fucking, it was, like, you know, it was, it was Arizona. You know, all the fucking shot, club yeah. shit. It was like, wow, this is the coolest shit fucking ever. And you know what? To this day, it's, it's grown. And it's much more fucking, you know, it's walk more, in. It's, yeah. it's more well put together. I, I'm sure it's from Tony. But fucking, dude, but even back then, like... You you needed something. You went to Ramjet. They had it, everything. Yeah, dude. Everything. He was showing me. He showed me like his back stock, like stock room. He's like, this is all our fucking knucklehead, panhead, shovelhead shit. We got everything you need for a transmission. And I was like, I was like, so, so you have more shit than Harley does, <laughs> dude. Oh, you need PM? We got PM, PM everything. everything. PM yeah. everything, <laughs> dude. Rebuild a PM yeah. caliper, dude. Yeah. Everything, dude. I'm telling you, I always tell her. I was like, man, fucking. If I had it in me still, like, I'd probably fucking like put a, like put my last penny in to fucking like open up a, a ramjet. Yeah. Open up a ramjet because let me tell you, those guys they sell they they can sell everything at retail. Yeah, because it's there. Yeah, they, they don't it's have to there. Yeah. They're not dealing with the fucking Amazon bullshit, the fucking eBay bullshit. They're like, oh, you want it now? Today, it's retail. And guess what? Good for them because they stuck and they were loyal to this industry. They're loyal to the fucking, uh, to the dealer base and all that shit. Yeah. And you know what? They deserve it. Fucking look at their new building. It's fucking amazing. Have you, you remember their first building? No, I never. The, the, the one for all these, no. they're there forever? Dude, it was there forever. But their new place is super dope. Dude, I got to piss real quick. Hold on. I'm done. I got to go. I told you guys it ended quickly. So anyway, I'm glad uh, you got to hear some of Sean. And uh, he's, he's a really knowledgeable dude. So if you're ever up in Vegas, man, check him out. At, uh, he's over there in Henderson. He's a good dude. Uh, solid, solid guy. Very talented fabricator, builder, welder. You know, he's a very tapped into the industry kind of guy. So uh, check him out. Also, don't forget to check out our sponsors dnd exhaust.com dnd exhaust on instagram and 844 dnd pipe if you want to get set up with one of those high performance uh exhaust flowing things uh don't forget to use that fast life code for a percentage off and don't forget to check out mark from texas performance mc uh you can also check him out on instagram under the same thing texas performance mc also don't forget f- f- Man, mess it up. Paint up for Metal Flake. Don't forget about him. Paintuffer.com if you want to check out some of the flakes. And uh, I want to thank you guys for continuing to help us out, man. Um, 
man, I appreciate it. Thank you for the Patreon support. Thank you for everything. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, having a few more podcasts coming out this week. I got uh, hopefully got John coming back on from Purpose Built. We're going to talk about some of these new bikes that are getting hit on the floors and coming out. And I know that, you know, I'm kind of excited about it. I think that a lot of people are. So I think that that's going to be a good podcast. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh, hopefully we can get FXR Mike to stop working so much and come back on and bless you guys with his presence again. And uh, anyway, we're all, we all got giddy up at the end of this, this, you know, this month. So we've been talking about it for a year, man. So it's about to happen. I'm really excited. We're going to do a booth. We're going to try to bring something. I don't fucking know what we're going to bring, but we're going to try to be there with something. Maybe just high fives. You know what I mean? I don't know. But anyways, I hope you guys all come out and I hope you realize that giddy up ain't shit without camping. So if you're just going to come to the show, you're missing out on half the fun. Uh, you should you, you should be getting set up already for uh, camp out, the camping thing. So you need to go on there. I think it's on the giddy up website or Camp Waco Springs. You can uh, check out and start um, getting your your spot, you know, get your camping stuff set up, you know, get pre-registered or whatever they call it. And also don't forget about our camp out that's coming up at the end of April. I keep forgetting the dates because I'm really not very organized right now. But, uh, you know, I'll get that posted up for you guys. But, man, I'm looking forward to it. We really haven't had a chance to dive too much into a lot of that that's going on. But it's definitely happened happening uh we're definitely still working with me and all the buddies at the uh you know the the north texas t-bars and anvil crew and you know mark from texas performance and you know the michigan boys like we're all coming down and we're gonna have a good time and i hope you guys uh make the effort to come out as well and and see what it's all about you know like this is the real biker shit man this is the stuff that's that that, that reminds you why you know you picked up or you bought that bike you know this this type of thing so Check it out. I hope you guys all come and, uh, you know, you guys have a good, good time. We'll see you later. Peace.